Hey, it's Craig Syracuse and welcome to another episode of Walk in Faith, the show where we go beyond the image and we discover who our guests really are. You might know them from TV, the big screen, or even the world of sports, but do we really know who they are as a person? Do we know what motivates them? Do we know what inspires them? Well, that's what we're here to find out. On this episode, editor emeritus of the tablet, Ed Wilkinson, joins us to talk about Catholic media until later in the episode when Ed turns the tables on me and starts interviewing me personally. Stay tuned and walk with us. So this is a this is a rare opportunity. They get to sit down with Ed Wilkinson. Thank you so much for this. Pleasure, Appreciate pleasure to be it. with you, Craig. You know, a lot of times people ask questions. They ask me questions, and I said I got to ask this guy. I got to ask Ed. <laughs> so first, tell me. I mean, because I've seen photos and stuff. But what was it like when you first started working for the tablet? What was it like? Tell me. What, and what year did you start? Well, I started uh, Craig in 1970, which was 48 years ago. I know I don't look it, but <laughs> I was 10 <laughs> years old at the time. <laughs> But I started 48 years ago, and uh, really it was a time when we were still using manual typewriters, and I didn't even have a phone on my desk. To make a phone call, I'd have to go out into the hall and go into this little closet, and then I'd make my calls from there. So it was a whole different world from what we're involved in today with Catholic Communications. It was just a different, different kind of world, and we typed everything on a manual typewriter on these green sheets of paper, and then we'd send it out to the printers. Today we do with you know our computers our individual computers we do what four or five people used to do you know setting type and designing and uh, so it's so different it's so different you just have to keep up with the times and keep up with the technology and it it just changes you know so quickly more and more even these days and when did the tablet start what year did it start the tablet started in 1908 1908 yeah and when it first started it was actually a private enterprise it wasn't owned by the diocese it was begun by a couple of uh, Brooklyn businessmen and Bishop McDonald was the Bishop of Brooklyn. He was the second Bishop of Brooklyn and he gave his blessing to the paper but he wanted to see if it could go on its own as a business venture. So he gave it six months. He saw that it was a going uh, a venture. It was, it was a good business operation. They were able to make some money and then he bought all the stock in the company and so it became the official diocesan newspaper. It was around Christmas time of 1908 and he named it the tablet because his favorite magazine was the Tablet of London, which is still in existence today. But he said, I want this to be called the Tablet after my favorite periodical. What did they focus on when the Tablet first started? Well, when they first started, it was really a, a very local paper. We still have a front page of it. And there's a story about a parish right there. That was the first news story about some pastor being uh, appointed to a particular parish. So it was very local oriented at that time the Brooklyn Diocese extended all across Long Island. So you had Brooklyn and Queens and Nassau, Suffolk County. It was all the way out there. I mean, most of it was concentrated here in Brooklyn uh, and a little bit in Queens. But uh, it was really a diocesan newspaper focusing on local events. They didn't have the kind of resources to have reporters and things like that. It was, it was mostly stuff that would come in through word of mouth, through the chancery, uh, mostly in-house stuff. And you started working, you said, in 19... I started in 1970. And it was really, at that time, the paper was changing again because through the 20s and the 30s, it became a national voice for the Catholic Church. And it was, it was very big in the, as an anti-communist fighter. It was big against communism. Patrick Scanlon was the editor. And he was a national Catholic figure who was the editor for 51 years. He was really a very notable person in Catholic journalism. So he really championed the cause against communism. And that's what the paper became known for. And so it had a following across the whole United States. As the Second Vatican Council came in and the church began to change, more and more dioceses began to have their own newspapers. So you didn't really need to have these national voices coming out of a diocese. So then there was more of an emphasis on making the paper a diocesan newspaper. And I was hired at a time when they were adding on reporters for each vicariate so that they could again make it more and more local, that each person would be assigned to a vicariate and cover the parishes to get the news out of those parishes into the newspaper. So it, it was kind of like doing a, uh, you know, a 360 at that point to go right back to where it had started from. You've been working for the tablet for 48 years. Did you ever, I mean, did you have a job in between or you went right from <laughs> seminary to? I, I was in the seminary and, uh, and I had a summer job and I was working in a youth center in Brooklyn with, uh, with young people in, uh, 
in what in those days we called the ghetto. So it was a big deal to work what in, area in was the ghetto. That? It was in South Williamsburg, which today is very not the ghetto. <laughs> yeah, it was very gentrified today, you know. But back then, you took your life in your hands going out in the streets in South Williamsburg, and it was a tough area. And we, I worked in a Catholic Charities Youth Center there, and it was a summer job. And I interviewed for the tablet uh, during the summer with, uh, thanks to a priest friend of mine who got me uh, uh, an interview with the editor. And my job was just about ready to finish in Williamsburg when I got a call one day, and it was Don Zirkel who was the editor at the time. And he said, are you still looking for a job? I said, yeah. He said, all right, you start Monday. And that's just oh when my, my other job was ending. So I, you know, I wasn't really sure what I was going to be doing. I didn't care what the pay was. I didn't know what the pay Do you was. What the pay was? <laughs> uh, it wound up being about five thousand six hundred dollars, I think, for the year. The year. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. It was fifty six hundred a year. That didn't matter to me. You know, I just wanted the job. I was working. And, and how uh, old were you at the time? I was twenty two. Twenty two. Yeah, twenty two. So I was just there, and I was uh, happy to have a job, and I worked full time. And uh, actually, we worked more than full time, you know, to, to get the thing done. Do but you remember the first day when you showed up? I do. I remember we worked at one Hanson place, and I remember walking down the hall toward the office and thinking to myself, how many times am I going to walk down this hall? You know, is this going to be just a short venture, or is this going to be something that lasts for a while? And little did I know that it was going to last <laughs> for 48 years, 48 you know. Years. So we've been in different locations, but at that time we were in one Hanson place, which was the tallest building in Brooklyn, and we were on the 21st floor, and the rents weren't what they are today, so we had a beautiful, uh, beautiful suite overlooking all of Brooklyn. It was a magnificent site that we probably couldn't touch today. <laughs> but now, during these 48 years, was there ever a time, or even when you first started, that you said, you know what, this isn't right for me, or, because people think working for the church, that it's, it's, it's easy, you know, work, mm -hmm. work for the church, they don't realize that sometimes it's, it could be difficult. Mm -hmm. Was it ever difficult for you, or did you ever think about maybe, you know, looking into a different sort of... Uh, yeah, there were, there were times when, uh, you know, changes were made in administrations, and, and you weren't sure about how things were, would be going, I, you know, I wasn't sure whether I was gonna stay or not. And, uh, and then, you know, there were times when you just weren't sure what you were doing or whether, whether this was going to hold up, you know, this kind of a job was going to hold up. So there were a few times when I decided that I might look around, but what happened was I think the work was always so interesting. It was almost really an extension of who I was because I knew so many of the people that I was dealing with and uh, it was just very, very easy, not, not easy to do, but easy to stay involved. You know, it was part of who I was being a Catholic and, uh, and a Brooklyn Catholic and reporting on local Catholic events. It was just, I felt at home doing it. So I think that's what kept me more, you know, I was always interested and it was always enjoyable to me. So I stayed on. I got a few more questions for you when we come back. We'll be right back with Ed Wilkinson. Welcome back, Ed. Thank you so much. So far, so good. Greg, good to um, be with I know you. We're gonna, I know we're going to switch it up at the end, but <laughs> so you know, it's it's not really common that you hear somebody works at the same company for forty eight years. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, it was it was more than a job; it was sort of your work. Mm -hmm. Were you also around, or you obviously were around when the Prayer Channel was? Mm -hmm. Can you sure. tell me a little bit about that? Because you hear the Prayer Channel. I mean, when I started, it was the sales media, Net TV, the Prayer right. Channel. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the Prayer Channel was uh, on here before the Net. You know, it was the pre preceded the Net. And uh, it wasn't as an ambitious program as, uh, as we have now at Net TV, but we did a show on there called Tablet Week in Review. And uh, John Kelly was the anchor at the time. And Brother Michelle, who was the program director, came to me one day at the Tablet, and I was the editor, and he said, uh, I'd like to do a local news show, a Catholic news show. And he said, you know, you guys uh, have the news here all the time, so why don't we do it in collaboration? So I looked at Brother Michelle, I said, TV? I don't know anything about TV, <laughs> you know, what do you want to do with TV? And he said, no, no, don't worry, we're going to do this, we're going to plan it out, it's going to be a year from now. And I said, oh, well, I could promise a year from now to anybody, you know. And then I remember a year went by and it was the night before the first show and I'm sitting at home saying, what the hell did I say <laughs> yes to? You know, I, I, I didn't know anything about television. And, um, and it was just, uh, it was a half hour news show and my part of it was to do uh, a 15 minute interview uh, segment each week. And we, the show went on for 18 years, which was wow. pretty good, you know. I mean, it was just blew my mind. And then, so that when Net was formed, Net TV and the sales media, 
I had worked with all these people already at the Pratt Channel, so it was a very easy meshing of the two groups because I knew most of the people already and uh, you know it was just like a hand in glove. You know, they were our predecessors. So. And during those 18 years, I mean, you must have interviewed you know, thousands of people. Does anyone stand out or is there anyone that, that sort of that you've met? I know you met Pope John Paul, but is there anyone that stands out that you actually were able to sit down with and connect? Yeah. Well, you know, I was always surprised. I interviewed uh, Cardinal O'Connor. I interviewed Bishop Egan before he became Cardinal Egan. And of course, all the bishops of Brooklyn would come and Cardinal Bevilacqua from Philadelphia. You know, I was always amazed that here I am, I'm just a, a kid off the streets of Greenpoint, that I'm sitting here talking with princes of the church, you know. And, uh, you know, I, those, those people, I think, stand out in, in my memory. And then as you go around working for the tablet, you meet mayors, you meet governors, and you're shaking hands with people, you know. And I always have to pinch myself sometimes when I'm in the room. One night I was in the room at the Al Smith dinner, and within sight there was President Obama, and Mitt Romney, you know, and I'm uh, sitting, standing there and I'm just saying, what am I doing here, you know, I mean, what am I doing here? And I'm just uh, a kid from Brooklyn, but that's the power of the media, and uh, I guess that's what a democracy is all about, you know, it doesn't it was, matter who you are, you have a say. And during those, when you met some of these people, was this something, well, it was Cardinal League, and was this something that, that sort of, that they said to you that, that has stuck with you all these years? Well, the thing that really struck me was that these were just ordinary men. They were ordinary people. We tend to put them on pedestals and we tend to think of, of them as, as uh, apart from us and separate and better than us. And really when you sit down and you begin to talk with them, you begin to realize that they're just another guy like you and I, you know, and, and you can talk to them like that. I remember when Cardinal Egan was still an auxiliary bishop and I was sitting next to him at a table one night and we were talking about New York Giants football, you know. And I said, this guy's pretty cool. You know, he's a nice guy. We talk about football. And, and then a guy like Bishop Daly, when he came, he had been a, a bishop in Boston, then he had been a bishop in Palm Beach, and then he came to Brooklyn. He was just like the life of the party. You know, he would just like to sit around and get with you and talk about uh, Irish poetry. And, you know, he was just a good guy. Well, he'd like to talk about sports. Being from Boston, he liked the Red Sox, though. And, uh, yeah. But he would just talk about things like that. And you, you really begin to realize, you know, that all of us in the church are really on an equal platform. It's just that we all have different functions. I mean, you have that show on the block, which sort of, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and you've had how many priests on? 50, yeah, we, 60 we've priests? Talked, yeah, we've talked about that many priests, and it's fascinating the stories that these guys have as they go along the line and why they decided to become a priest. On the block is meant to be just we sit on a stoop, we sit on a staircase somewhere, and we talk about why did you want to become a priest? Because today not a lot of people want to be priests, no, you know, especially with some of the things that are going on in the church today. But we talk to these guys and everybody has such a unique story. And people have said to me, you know, the reason I like that show is because you humanize the priests. You know, I begin to realize that they have a story just like you and I. Uh, you know, that they are people too. They bleed the same way you bleed. You know, they hurt the same way you hurt. And uh, somewhere along the line, something happened to them and they had a, you know, they decided to turn their life over to this special role in the church. So, I, you know, I find the stories to be very inspirational. I, we had a priest on who was, uh, grew up being a surfer boy down in Rockaway. Yes. We had another guy who was a, uh, a radio broadcaster, turned out to be an auxiliary bishop in New York. So we've had all kinds of different people and they became priests, hopefully. Somebody watching that can say, you know, I agree. if they're thinking about it, if the germ is there inside the seed, maybe they'll consider it because is it's there, just ordinary people. Is there something that sort of connects them all, like some sort of underlining factor that sort of unites them or connects them? I know they have different stories, but what connects them all? I think what connects them all is that they've been touched by faith in some way during their lives. Something along the line has, you know, made them stand up and realize that there's more to life than just living day in and day out and trying to make as much money as you can and having the best house and, and that, you know, they see the human condition. I think priests really do have that insight into the human condition that they see we're all fallible and that we need to be picked up at times and, and we need each other in some kind of a faith community that, and we have to realize that there is something more to life, that there is a supreme being, you know, there is a creator. We, we didn't all just didn't come from nowhere. There's a reason for this. And I think that's the purpose of a priest is to help people to see that purpose that they have and the connection that Jesus has in all of their lives. I agree. And, and like you said, we all have a purpose. We all have an assignment. Mm -hmm. But one thing, too, that I, I've 
come to notice is, you know, for myself, I'll say God show me a sign or I feel like God's talking to me. Sometimes it's difficult because I always say we expect the burning bush. We expect him to come down and, and speak to us when in actuality he speaks to us or other people. So if someone's out there, a, a kid or an adult, and, and he's questioning, is this what God really wants me to do? What would you say to them? Like, how do they know? I mean, how did you know? Or why did you decide to join the seminary? Mm -hmm. How does someone know? You know, what I say to these priests is, uh, you know, when you hear about a vocation, they always say it's a call from God. And I remember when I was in the seminary, they'd yeah. always say it was a call from you God. thought he was you know? picking up the phone. And, and I, you know, I said, I never heard anybody call out to me. <laughs> you know? And I'll say to these guys, what was the call? And they'll tell you, well, it's not a voice coming from somewhere. You know? It usually comes through another person or, or another incident or uh, maybe sometimes through the faith of the family. But it always comes through some other human ways that you say, you know what, you know, it, it calls you to go beyond yourself, that, you know, it's just it's not all about you, that it really does, it's all about other people. And there are certain connections that people make in life, I think, that make them realize that. And some guys want to take it to the next step and help other people see that. That's the role of the priest. You're right, and I think your show, like you said, it really touches on that. Yeah. Because you, you touched on a few things, and it's not about money, it's not about us, it's about other people. And we've had guys on the show who, before they went into the seminary, they made a lot of money, you know. They made a lot it's, of money on Wall Street. I know one guy that we had on the show gave all his money away before he was ordained. He gave it to, a, uh, to the Catholic worker over in Manhattan. The stories you hear are really heroic stories, and you begin to realize why parishioners become so attached to their, to their priest, why they love their priest so much, is because they see the goodness in them. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Ed, we'll be right back. I know okay, you want to switch. Okay, then I'm going to ask you a few questions. Okay, <laughs> I'll get ready. We'll be right back with Ed Wilkinson. Well, we're back, okay, and I know uh, you want to switch things around. Let's switch it around. You know, on On the Block, I always start my last segment. I say, hey, I'm Ed Wilkinson. Welcome back to On the Block, and this is Craig that we're talking with. You know, one of the things I know that you're, you're, at the, you're a filmmaker, yes, and yes. you recently produced a wonderful Emmy-nominated documentary. Tell us, it's about the boxing world. What's in the title? So it's Ring of Faith. Ring of Faith. So where does this interest in boxing come from? I've always had a connection to boxing. I did a film with a world champion boxer a few years ago. And, you know, I always try to figure, try to think about, okay, why did God, you know, sort of create these relationships? And so what seed is being planted? So I used to always watch these award ceremonies. And I remember like Whitney Houston, they would mm -hmm. get up and say, I want to thank, you know, Jesus Christ. I want to thank God, the Lord, my Savior. And then over time, I wouldn't see it anymore. And as, as a kid growing up, I was inspired by that. And I started to watch sports a little bit, and I'm not a big sports guy, but in boxing, you would always see, the first thing they would say is, I wanna thank God, I wanna thank God. So I started to explore that, and I said, why is that so common in, in boxing, especially such a violent sport? So I started to dive into it a little bit, and I saw there was a huge connection between sports or boxing and faith. So I started to ask myself this question. I said, okay, I believe God gave me a gift. Like, you have a gift, I have a gift. And I said, a boxer mm -hmm. has a gift, right? Mm -hmm. His gift is boxing. Mm -hmm. So I said, is that a sin? And if I have this gift, which is athleticism or boxing, when does that gift become a sin? So it started to become this question, and I said, this is my thesis. I said, is it a gift? Is it a gift from God? Now who's to say it is, it isn't? So I started to explore that. And you know, at, at first I was like, this is a great idea, right? But then I get nervous and concerned and fear, and I say the enemy mm -hmm. starts to come in and starts to give me reasons why I shouldn't do it. And I'm talking to my wife, and uh, I said, I want to do this project, and she shows me a picture of Pope Francis, and he's holding the belt. And I said, okay, this is a sign. Now, this is years, uh -huh. you know, years, uh, years ago, I should say. So he started with the project, one by one, it started to really flourish. And then years later, I wound up, you know, getting Pope Francis in the documentary. Mm -hmm. We got to the UN, and I wound up meeting Mario Lopez and interviewing him, and he's in the film. I didn't know Mario Lopez, I didn't know any of them, but and now we're up for an Emmy, but it was a long, long but journey. Bo boxing can be rather controversial. Like you said, some people think it's a sin. Some people think boxing's immoral because of the damage that you might do to the other boxer. So after sitting down and talking with all of these boxers and people who are involved in the game, did you come down on the side that it's immoral or do you think it's a, it's a relevant sport today? I mean, I, I watched boxing all the time. 
I mean, I was at the fights and I studied it. And I, I think I really, I do that when I'm working on a project. You start to really marry the project and know everything about it. Mm -hmm. And then I worked uh, with a couple of doctors on CTE, right? We went to Boston University and I was you know, for it. I started to talk to him and do an interview. And it was probably the next couple of days I realized like, I can't support this anymore. I can't support this, mm -hmm. this sport. And I stopped watching it. And I try to watch it and now I'm just like, I don't have that same connection to it as much as I did. And it could be because I really focused on it so much, but mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like, and this is probably my next project, is that I think God gives us these gifts for a reason, right? But it's not so much the gift of boxing, it's the platform they create during that process. At one so, time, boxing was really a way out for a lot of people who yes. lived with a lower class people. You know, it was big in the neighborhoods. Even the Catholic Church embraced it a lot, sponsoring boxing events and things like that. So in a sense, it did some social good there, right? It has, and a lot of people say it's sort of the, the sport for an immigrant. You know, as the immigrant, it, you could see, like it used to be a lot of Jewish boxers, and then you don't see anyone really, as one or two fighters. Then it was the Irish, and it was the Italian, and then it was the Spanish, and, the, and now it's Ukrainian and Russian. And it keeps changing, it, it keeps sort of evolving. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of boxers too, they use that platform. I, knew, I know a lot of boxers personally that you know, whether it's Pacquiao or Klitschko or Pauli Malinaji, a lot of them use that platform to, you know, give back the same way Tim Tebow does. So I think that God gave him this gift for a reason. It might not be just f for the sake boxing, but it's mm -hmm. to create this platform for them to do something on later in life. Well, you mentioned Paulie, and uh, he was, uh, I think, a middleweight champion. Yeah. Uh, two, he's, three times world yeah, champion. Yeah, right here from Brooklyn. He's a friend of yours, I know. Yeah, uh, very good. What is he doing these days, and what kind of a platform does he have? So he does a lot with Showtime, so he's on Showtime now. But he also helps out. A good friend of mine runs Cops and Kids, who was affiliated with the PAL, and they, they sort of give a place for kids to learn about boxing, but it's not really boxing. It's like, we just assume that kids come from the same sort of household as me, middle class, both parents, you know, always somebody there. Mm -hmm. A lot of these kids that grow up in these neighborhoods don't have anybody. Mm -hmm. There's no outlet for them. So my friend pulls them in, and Paul is affiliated with this organization, and he gives them a place to train, and he gives them a father figure, and teaches them about life and in a positive way. But they use, as he says, they use boxing as the carrot on the stick. Do you think boxing, though, has lost some of its uh, popularity? Because, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s, do a big names, Muhammad Ali and, uh, you know, uh, Ken Norton and all these people and people followed them and everybody knew who the heavyweight champion of the world was. I heard the heavyweight champ's name the other day and I didn't recognize who it was, you know. Mm. I mean, what, what has happened over the last 20, 30 years, do you think? I mean, it's like when Mike Tyson was around, that was everyone would talk about mm. and watch now for heavyweight fighters on. There's so many belts and so many titles and I think, yeah, like you said, it has, it has been saturated. Do I think it will change or go back? I don't know. I mean, they've said, you know, when they get a, you know, a really good world champion, and there's been some really heavy, good heavyweight world champions, but I don't know if it's still going to have that sort of, that sort of connection. I know like UFC is popular, which is something I don't support at all. Mm -hmm. It's not into UFC, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I don't know if, uh, if it will ever be the way it was when you were growing up. Who were some of the bigger names that uh, you interviewed for this, uh, uh, for this documentary? And, and what did you learn from them? I mean, I learned a lot. I mean, one thing I learned, and I say, you know, they only see two colors, right? They see the black corner and the red corner. They don't care what religion, what background, what demographic, none of that means anything. And so I, I learned a lot from them. I said, if they could see past these differences that we look at, so, you know, and this person comes from this background or this faith, this religion, this, this sort of part of society, they see past all of that. Everyone's considered like a brother. Mm -hmm. So everyone that I met, they might have this big macho, you know, persona, but that's only in front of the cameras. Mm -hmm. And then they're brothers, they're mm -hmm. friends, mm -hmm. and they don't care what religion you are. So I said, wait, if they can see past those differences, why can't we? Mm -hmm. And then after they fight or they beat each other up in the ring or whatever, they're brothers, they hug. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all friends. So I learned a lot from them. I was really inspired and, you know, and they were all nice. I've never met, I, I, I really can't, I think of all the celebrities and people I've met, I never met anybody that wasn't nice. They were mm -hmm. all nice. You mentioned Pope Francis made his way into this film somehow. Uh, what, yeah. what, what has he got there? What uh, part that, is he? <laughs> that was Vinnie Levy and that helped out, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I mean, the way it all worked out is it's God. I mean, God has his hand on this. I knew we were going to be nominated for an Emmy. I have been practicing my speech, and I yeah. know that. It's not about me. Believe me, this is all about God. And, and mm -hmm. every step along the way, God's hand's been involved in this. He was doing something at, you know, at the Vatican, and we saw it, and I think Vinnie and I saw it, and I said, I'd love to go. 
and they invited us, and Vinny and I were able to attend the Vatican where they had this UN conference, mm -hmm. and the Pope spoke, and you know he was speaking about sports and faith and how we can use sports as a way of uniting people, which is the essence of the film. It adds so much to the project, and in sure. the end, sure. the guy also that he was holding a belt, which I can't remember his name now, he's from Argentina. I wound up meeting him. Mm -hmm. Like all of these people I met, I met him at the Barclay Center. God was involved the whole way, mm -hmm. and then and now well, we're up for an Emmy. Where will they be able to see this? So it, it's getting distribution, so the distribution company will release it. You know, hopefully it's Showtime. The president of Showtime's in the film, and he helped me. Steven Espinoza was very, in, in, you know, he was helped me throughout this whole process. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it'll be Showtime, HBO, uh, Netflix, Hulu, all of the platforms. I pray it goes in movie theaters for a day, which is called Fathom Movie Theaters. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it should be in about two to three months. It should be out on most of the platforms. And if somebody's not a sports fan, can they still get something out of this film? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, you, I couldn't name one football player. I mean, I don't, <laughs> besides Tim Tebow, I don't know anything about sports. I mean, I don't, I'm not a sports guy. And it's not really about the sports. It's about the connection you will make because there are so many characters in the film and you will relate to one of them. One of them will have a similar story and you'll see that you could see past the differences just the same way a boxer mm -hmm. can. I know we mentioned Paulie. I mean, besides Paulie, who were some of the other name boxes that you had? Sean Porter. Sean Porter is an amazing person, the ghost. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all, you know, Christian, Catholic fighters. You know, Steven Espinoza, Teddy Atlas. We've covered probably 30, 40, 50 different boxers. Mm -hmm. Floyd Mayweather's in it for about a minute and a half, which, you know, you ask him about his faith, and he does have, I mean, beyond what you see, they do have a strong connection to faith. So how come we don't see this in the secular media? You know, none of this faith uh, aspect comes through for some of these popular people, but the only place you're gonna see it is, say, in a documentary like you've just produced. Is it that people don't it's, care about it? It's just not involved? It's, it's interesting, because I, I had this conversation years ago. The point of this show started because of a seed that was planted at my other job. I always said, how come we can't ask celebrities about faith? Yeah. And I've been around a lot of celebrities. Everyone that I've met, they always say I'm blessed. It's a blessing. They always talk about faith, mm -hmm. but it's always cut out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been on set with so many Backstreet Boys, and they'll say, I'm blessed, there's a blessing, but it's cut out, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's the same thing with a lot of these athletes. Like, some of them don't want to, don't want to talk about their faith because they'll be alienated or they'll, it, there's always an issue, but a lot of them are very open about their faith. Mm -hmm. Whether that makes it into the piece is another story. Yeah. So I think it's, it's just whoever, whoever's editing the project, whoever, whatever network, they want to control, I guess, yeah. whatever's put out into the media, but... They're always talking about well, I guess that's why you and I are involved in Catholic media. It's an alternative voice, an alternative platform, right? Yep. And people can say who really they are. I'm going to throw the last word back to you, Craig. Well, <laughs> thank you, Ed. It's, it's, it's interesting to be interviewed on my, own, on my own show. But I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. And if you have any questions or concerns, please give us a call or call Ed directly. <laughs> thank you so much, Ed. God bless. Thank, thank you. you. Hope you enjoyed today's episode of Walk in Faith. Always remember, you have the ability to inspire and evangelize through your words and actions.